So tonight, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna share something pretty awesome that, that I find very very awesome, especially for the kids, okay? And not only just for the kids, but for us adults, because as adults, we think that we know it all, huh? I asked my kid, I asked my my ten year old Abel yesterday morning. I said, "Where is God at right now? Right now, where is God at? What is God doing?" And he says, well, I guess he's sleeping. I said, why do you say that? And he goes, well, I don't know. I don't know what God's doing. So it's just something for, for all of us to stop and, and, and really focus on because I'm going to read Genesis chapter 1 tonight. Now, we've all read Genesis chapter 1. All of Christianity has read Genesis chapter 1. And it's just really, really awesome that as we go through it to kind of really focus on what we're reading but more importantly, kind of focus on what God is doing here. I'm going to read here from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and following. And it says, The first story of creation. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless wasteland, and darkness covered the abyss, while a mighty wind swept over the waters. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw how good the light was. God then separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Thus evening came, the morning followed. That's the first day, okay? It says, Then God said, Let there be a dome in the middle of the waters to separate one body of water from the other. And so it happened. God made the dome and it separated the water from the dome from the water below it. God called the dome the sky. Evening came and morning followed the second day. So let's just stop and think about it for a minute. Where is heaven at? Where do you, where do you guys say heaven is? Above. Above what? Above. In the sky? Anybody else? Any other thoughts? Where is heaven at? Where God's at? That's a, that's a good answer. But where do you say heaven's at? House. So when you look into the sky, you say there's the heavens. Is that what we say? Yeah. Past, the, past the universe, because he holds even the stars in his hands. So it's even beyond that, right? That's a very important answer that she just said. So let's go on a little bit further. Verse 6. Verse 9, Then God said, Let the water under the sky be gathered into a single basin, so that the dry land may appear. And so it happened. The water under the sky was gathered into its basin, and the dry land appeared. God called the dry land the earth. And the basin of the water he called the sea. God saw how good it was. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth vegetation, every kind of plant that, that bears seed, and every kind of fruit tree on earth that bears fruit with its seed in it. And so it happened. The earth brought forth every kind of plant that bears seed and every kind of fruit tree on it. On the earth that bears fruit with its seed in it. God saw how good it was. Evening came and morning followed the third day. Then God said, Let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night. Let them mark the fixed times, the days, and the years and serve, and serve as luminarias in the dome of the sky to shed light upon the earth. And so it happened. God made the two great lights, the greater one to govern the day and the lesser one to govern the night. And he made the stars. God set them on a dome, in the dome of the sky to shed light upon the earth to govern the day and the night and to separate the light from the darkness. God saw how good it was. Evening came, the morning followed the fourth day. Then God said, Let the water teem with the abundance of living creatures. And on the earth let birds fly beneath the dome of the sky, and so it happened. God created the great sea monsters and all kinds of swimming creatures with which the water teems and all kinds of winged birds. God saw how good it was, and God blessed them, saying, Be fertile, multiply, and fill the water of the seas. And let the birds multiply on the earth. Evening came, the morning followed the fifth day. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth of all kinds of living creatures. Cattle, creeping things, and wild animals of all kinds. And so it happened. God made all kinds of wild animals, all kinds of cattle, all kinds of creeping things, 
of the earth, God saw how good it was. Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and the cattle, and over all the wild animals, and all the creatures that crawl on the ground. God created man in his image, and in the divine image he created him. Male and female he created them. God blessed them, saying, Be fertile, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and of all the living things that move on the earth. God also said, See, I give you every seed-bearing plant all over the earth, and every tree that has seed-bearing fruit on it to be your food. And to all the animals of the land, all the birds of the air, and all the living creatures that crawl on the ground, I give all the green plants for food. And so it happened. God looked at everything He had made and found it very good. Evening came, the morning followed the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth and all their array was completed. Since on the seventh day God was finished with the work He had been doing, He rested on the seventh day from all the work He had undertaken. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it He rested from all the work He had done in creation. Such is the story of the heavens and the earth and their creation. Now, when we read this Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and following, there's a lot in here, okay? But it's actually pretty awesome to actually go through it. Now, when we read that first verse, it says, Let there be light, and there was light. What light was that? Right? So it wasn't the sun, right? Because he, he didn't create the sun till the second day. How many of you guys have ever caught that before when he said, Let there be light, and there was light? Verse 1 it says, In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless wasteland, and darkness covered the abyss, while a mighty wind swept over the waters. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. So, a lot of times we just kind of read over things and not through them, not paying attention. And even myself, when I went back and I read this, I said, wait a minute. There's got to be a natural light on the earth because God did not create the sun that gives this light into the second day. And He didn't create... Uh, the moon till later, and none of the stars till later. How many of you guys have ever caught that when you read that before? It's pretty awesome when you actually look at that, because the reason why this is so important is because a lot of people don't even focus on creation. You know, many people say, well, how do I know there's a God? How do I know God even existed? How do I know that it was God that created such things. How do I know that that these things that took place really happened, and so on and so forth? There's always these questions. Well, when you go back and you actually read this, and as we go over tonight, this should shed a little light on, on our thoughts, on our faith, and our belief. Now, if you go with me to verse 6, okay? He says, Let there be a dome in the middle of the waters to separate one body of water from the other. So let there be a dome in the middle of the waters to separate one body of water from the others. What does that mean? Earth? Earth? Land? Yeah, it says, let there be a dome in the middle of the waters to separate one body of water from the other. Well, you guys all read this before, right? Well, what does it mean? What is it? He say? He's, he's calling it a what? A dome, right? He said, let there be a dome in the middle of the waters to separate one body of water from the other. So it happened. God made the dome, and it separated the water above the dome from the water below it. So that's the sky of water. It's kind of the ocean. So the sky, whatever's up in the sky, right? Does that make sense or no? The atmosphere? 
atmosphere. Uh, this is very, very important because I had never caught on to this before. You know, we've read it, humanity has read it, but it says, let there be a dome in the middle of the waters to separate one body of water from the other. And so what happened, God made a dome and it separated the water above the dome from the water below it. God called the dome the sky. When you keep on reading, it kind of, kind of tells you <laughs> what it's talking about. Okay, so it says, evening came, morning fall, the second day. Okay, so this dome separates the water on the earth, and it's got, according to what we're reading, that it's separating water on the other side of the dome, right? On the other side of the sky, right? What water? The what clouds. is this? The clouds. Universe, because that's what brings down water. Since there's a diagram on the thing that says most water's above the firmament. Yeah, which is the atmosphere. How many of you guys have ever gone over this before? This is the creation, you guys. We talk about scriptures, we talk about God, we talk about all this stuff, and yet here's the very creation before us. And, 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 and sometimes we kind of look at this like it's strange, you know, like it's like, what do you mean? I don't understand. Let's read, let, okay, so I put some notes here and I put, let there be a dome in the middle of the waters to separate one body of water from the other. God made the dome and it separated the water above the dome from the water below it. God called the dome the sky. This was the second day. So... Even though you look at this picture, even though you say, well, it's the, the clouds up there, it's, this is something above the sky, right? Yeah. Above, above the blue skies. When you look at the skies, you see the clouds. According to the scripture, it's on the other side of this dome, right? Just, uh, just food for thought. We're going to keep going, but just food for thought. So verse 9, okay? Then God said, let the water... Under the sky be gathered into a single basin, so that the dry land may, may appear. And so it happened. The water under the sky was gathered into its basin, the dry land appeared. God called the dry land the earth. Why is God doing this? Why is God getting dirt in between this, this basin? Because He wants us to, He needs us to survive. Because we won't be able to survive without land because the land, he's giving us everything to nourish off of, to build stuff, to, to create stuff off this earth, the dirt, you know, all, all the materials you know, are provided for us. So that's why we, that's why he's providing us that land. Had you seen that before in that scripture? No, I'm just bringing it up out of my head. But that's, but that's the perfect answer. But just, let's just stop it. All we're doing tonight is really seeing what God did for all humanity, no? Because even when I went back, I said, wait a minute. I, I, my answer was exactly the same as yours. I had never seen that God was planning everything for us. As He's creating all this stuff, He already knows what He's going to do. He already knows why He's doing it, who He's going to do it for. And it keeps on going. On verse 9, He says, And so it happened. The water under the sky was gathered into a basin, and the dry land appeared. God called the dry land the earth, and the basin of the water He called the sea. God saw how good it was. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth vegetation, every kind of plant that bears seed, and every kind of fruit tree on earth that bears fruit with its seed in it. And so it happened. The earth brought forth every kind of plant on, that bears seed, and every kind of fruit tree on it that bears fruit with its seed in it. God saw how good it was. Evening came, morning called the third day. So we're reading on the third day how God... As he's creating all these things, he has us in mind, huh? He has people in mind, humanity in mind, and also creatures in mind, huh? God said, let the water under the sky, which is the heavens, be, back, be gathered into a single basin. All the lights in the dome, okay, remember all the lights that we were talking about? So then he talks about these two great lights, okay, so the next... Things that then God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky. 
So the dome of the sky uh, is what, what how we described it, a wall over that separates the body of water from the bottom to the body of water on top. No? To separate day from night, let them mark the fixed times, the days and the years, and serve as luminarios, uh, luminarios, luminarios in the dome of the sky to shed light upon the earth. And so what happened? God made two great lights, the greater one to govern the day and the lesser one to govern the night. And He made the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to shed light upon the earth to govern the day and the night and to separate light from darkness. God saw how good it was. Evening came, morning fall, the fourth day. So this is the fourth day of creation, okay? Now I just want to stop real quick and just have you guys place this in your mind. So the first day, God created the light, not the sun, not the moon, but God created the light. The sun was created on the fourth day. So remember, just on the first day, the first day was because God knew nothing can grow without it, right? So how does any, everything grow? Well, no? Well, the light, the sun, and then the, the heavens, which... But look how he started. What was the first thing he started with? Like the light. Just light, huh? So how does everything begin? See, we're, we're taught that without the sun, nothing grows, nothing blah, blah, blah. We're taught without certain things, things are not right. But what we just read here is that when God started everything, he started everything with light. No, just light. Not sunlight, not moonlight, but just light. So the first light was because God knew that nothing can grow without it, right? So the first thing God did, He says, let there be light. And there was light. God saw how good the light was. Then God separates the light from the darkness, right? So immediately, the first thing God did, from the very beginning of creation, is that he created light, no? Because there was what before? It was all darkness, right? So he comes and he creates, he goes, let there be light. There was light. Then he separates the darkness from the light, no? It's pretty awesome because even in our lives, even in, in good and bad, you separate light and dark, no? So even as, as human beings, we do that, no? But what's more awesome to see is that when God started it, He separated light from darkness in the very beginning. Huh? We're in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and following. And we're talking about creation. We're talking about how God created all things and how He began with this creation. So the first thing He starts with is, let there be light. Okay, so God knew that nothing could grow without it. That there could be no life, no nature, the light of the sun. Later on, we're going to read about the light of the sun. But as, as, as God started, He started out with just light, okay? So if we can actually just stop and picture that, that when God started creating all things, He said, because it says that the world was just a formless wasteland, it was just all darkness, and God said, let there be light. So you can just imagine this light coming on and then this natural light. We call it natural light. I don't know what God called it then besides light, but this light comes on. And then the second thing He says, let's separate the light from the darkness. No? So then that's how we get day and night. That's how God started it. So day two, okay? We talked about this a few minutes ago. That when God created... This dome that later on he calls it the, the sky. He says, I'm going to create a dome that's going to separate the water on the earth and the water above the dome. Okay? So now we're coming back to this dome. Someone said atmosphere. Who said atmosphere in the beginning? So Carter said atmosphere. So day two, God created the atmosphere 
Because plants, animals, and humans cannot live without what? The ozone layer. Oxygen, wow. Oxygen yeah. air, Oxygen. right? Yeah, that's why we need the ozone layer. So without air, there's nothing, right? So just picture what God did from the very beginning. First, He brings out light, huh? Then He brings, then He separates this dome from the water on the bottom to the water on the top. You know, He has this atmosphere. This atmosphere, now He's bringing air, right? Air into this equation of creation because without light, there is no life. There ain't no nature. There ain't no plants. There ain't nothing. And then without air, okay? Without air, nothing survives, right? So, it's pretty awesome when you actually go back and see how God created things, you know, and you see this atmosphere because plants, animals, humans cannot live without air. So, without air, can sound or sound or speech or hearing happen without air? No? So without air, you can't hear nothing, you can't speak nothing. So that's the other part when God brought the atmosphere in the air, is so because he knew there's gonna start being sounds, okay? There's gonna be speech coming out of whatever he was gonna create. So that's all day two. Day three, so remember I'm separating it three days here, and I'm gonna separate three days over here. The, th the first three days is God created light, not the sun. He, he created light because without it, nothing can grow, nothing can survive, nothing can even live. Day two, He created the atmosphere because the plants, animals, and humans cannot live without air. And without air, there cannot be no sound, no speech, no hearing. Day three, the earth had to be dry so plants can grow. So in other words, when, when God created, He said, let's get all the water and put it into one basin so that we can have dry spots so that things can grow out of that, you know, the dry spots that, you know, Carlos described it earlier, so that plants can start growing, so things can start coming out of the ground. Now, we didn't know any of this. You know, when God created the world, we didn't even exist yet. So what God is creating, now as human beings, we've come to learn that, we've come to understand that, but if we take our mind back all the way to the creation, what God did for us was incredible. The way He created all the universe, and the way He placed everything for us was put together just perfect. Huh? So day three, the earth had to have dry plants, or dry dirt so that plants and everything can grow. But for them to grow, Plants needed the light, the air, and the dirt. But they also needed water and moisture or dew, right? Because without that, nothing can grow, right? Without that water, nothing can grow. So keep that mind and thought, uh, keep that thought in mind because remember we we're talking about that dome? That God created this dome that separated the water on the earth to the water above that dome? That's where we're going to start, if we have the time, we're going to talk about that moisture, that dew, no? because that's where all that, that body of water that's up there that eventually comes down to earth. No? I'm not a scientist, I'm not anything like that. This is just something for us to open up our minds to how God created all things. If you have the time or the energy to dig more deeper into it, it's, it's awesome because sometimes humanity or science take the credit all for themselves. No? Well, according to what we've uh, discovered, this is the way we believe things work. Well, if they would just believe in God, they would just read what God did, and they wouldn't uh, place it toward scientific discoveries or otherwise. No? It's pretty awesome because as I get to the end of tonight's teaching, it's pretty awesome that as I went over this myself, I really, really learned a lot. Now, I really learned on how God created things, but more importantly, I learned why 
we're still be taken care of today. In other words, like I'll, I'll ask uh, Honey, Honey, where, what is God doing right now? What do you believe that God is doing right now? In other words, we're told that God worked for six days, right? He created all the world and everything in it. And the seventh day He rested, right? So what do you think He's doing now? Is He still resting or what is He doing? Creation. He's still creating things. But according to Scripture, He's already created all things, right? So what do you think He's doing now? My son Abel's answer was, he's sleeping, no? He's not doing nothing no more, he's sleeping. So, I don't know what your guys' thoughts are. He's watching over us. He's watching over us. That's a, that's, a, that's a perfect answer because as you follow me through this teaching tonight, that's almost a precise answer what God is doing for all of us right now. Not only over all of us, but everything that He created, no? All the animals, all the plants, God never stopped. No? He continued watching over. So I hope you see the same thing toward the end, okay? So those are the, 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 the first three days. The fourth day, you know, He created the bodies of light. He created the sun and the moon that gave us light and also the stars. On the fifth day, He created the, the inhabitants of the air and the water which are the fishes, you know, everything, the creeping crawlers, all this stuff, right? And on the sixth day, He created the inhabitants of the dry land, which is man and beast, okay? So, first day, light. Second day, atmosphere. Dividing the waters into the sky and the earth. Third day, dry land. Fourth day, bodies of light. Fifth day, inhabitants of the air and water, birds and fishes. Six day inhabitants of the dry land, which is man and beast. So this is the creation of the world. When nothing existed, who existed? Before any of this got created, who existed? So God has always existed, right? That's why when you read, let us create man in our image and likeness. Let us do this, let, let us do that. We're not going to get into that, but even the Old Testament opens up humanity's eyes and ears to the Trinity or the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. No? But tonight we're going to just totally focus on just uh, creation, okay? Just all creation. So God has no past, God has no future, God always was and always is, okay? So God is the creator of all that is invisible invisible. So whatever we see, or whatever we hear, or whatever uh, somebody talks about, God is the creator of all things. So here's the question to all you guys. When scripture says on the seventh day he rested, what does that mean to you guys? He wants us to rest on the Sabbath. That's, that's one of the prime examples that God gave us is that as we work through the whole week or whatever, on the Sabbath day, on the Lord's day, now we stop and reflect on how many hours we put in for the week, how much money we made, you know, what kind of foods that we did that week, what kind of uh, business deals. That's what, we, that's what we're supposed to do on the Lord's day, right? Absolutely the opposite. The Lord gave us that day as an example to reflect on Him. To take our mind thoughts back to what He did from the very beginning. To, 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 to reflect on God, to reflect on our spirituality, to reflect on everything that God has given to us, all the good, and you know, everything positive. That's when, when you read that scripture and it says that God rested on the seventh day, he looks back and he says, everything that I have done, I look at it and it is good. So when scripture says that he rested on the seventh day, that's what he wants you and I to do. How many of us do that? How many of us on the Lord's day sit back and reflect on him? 
That's amazing that we don't do that. And I speak for myself. You know, I'm worried. You know, I go to church. I'm, but after church, I'm worried about breakfast. I'm worried about maybe checking out a movie. I'm worried about doing this. I'm worried. But I'll tell you what, guys. And I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. After going over this teaching, you know, we've all been taught growing up, you know, the Lord's Day is a day of rest and reflection. We've all been taught that. But somehow, some way, it's, it's been taken away from us by ourselves, okay? We crowd it in with everything else. I hope and I pray that as we go through tonight's uh, teaching or talk or topic, that we really stop and reflect on that. Take a walk through the park. See what God has created from the flowers that are growing to the trees. You know, see if you can... Uh, you know, it, it, it's amazing to me that mankind will do so many things on uh, all the day. And, 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 and let me just interrupt myself. Did you know that even non-believers enjoy that Sunday off? Atheists, the people who don't believe in God, they still follow the tradition of man, the tradition of humanity to take it easy on the Lord's day and they don't even believe in God, but yet they follow suit with humanity. It's crazy to even think about that. But I had never thought about it until going over this talk. My mind got opened up to a bunch of things. And the most important thing for me is to see that when the Scripture says that God rested on the seventh day, not because He was tired, because He wanted to look back on all the good that He created and see how beautiful it was. So as I was going over this, I said, well, Lord, Santiago across the room has always said this and it never really clicked into me, but, you know, when a man looks at a woman, you're supposed to look at that woman as a perfect creation of your sister. And when a woman looks at a man, you're supposed to look at that perfect creation of your brother, no? And the thing is, is that we've, we've actually taken our mind thought and distorted all of that. But now is the time for us to go back and look about the basics of humanity. The basics of creation is so beautiful, so awesome that what God did for all of us, we should actually look back and be very thankful and very grateful. So on the Lord's day, you know, keeping holy the Sabbath day is one of the commandments. That's why God gave us that commandment to keep holy the Sabbath day, the Lord's day, so that we can turn back and we can reflect on what He's done, on what He's created. And when you look in the mirror, the next time you look in the mirror, look at that beauty that God created. Because God said... You know, even, even before I, I, I formed you in the womb, I knew you. So we can see how perfect each and every one of us are and how perfect all of creation is out there and how perfect God placed everything together for all of us. So when Scripture says that He rested on the seventh day, do you believe that He was finished? No. God was not finished. So, I put a note here and I said, God never stopped. You know why? Let me explain to you why. And this is my note to myself. So just because the universe was finished, when a builder builds something, who takes care of that building? Well, the owner does first, right? The owner has to take care of what he's built, right? That's his responsibility. So, being that man did not create the universe, being that God created the universe, who has to take care of it? We do. He and he. Can we, can human beings possibly take care of this universe? The reason why I say this is because as we get a little bit deeper, you know, when you look how complex, who can control that sun? God. 
Who can control the moon from coming up and going down? Can man do any of this? Who can control the suns to be up there floating? I'm just using my own words. But who can control the stars up there, keeping them in a certain place at a certain distance? Who can control all this? Only one person, huh? How many of you guys have ever thought about that? That, you know, we take it for granted that we look at the clock and we say in X amount of time, mankind, survivalists will tell you that sun's going to go down in 22 minutes. And in 22 minutes, will that sun go down? Yeah. So they studied it, no? But can man control when that sun goes down or when it comes up? No. Can man control... The rain coming down from the skies. No. How about the snow? So who can take care of the universe? Only God that created it, right? Man cannot take care of it, huh? So that's why I put this note here. It said, just because the universe was finished, God did not cease to take care of it. To create a world, to create a universe... He would be the one to take care of it. That doesn't mean that we don't have no part in it because you and I know we do have a part in it. But He is the master. He is the creator of it. Now, I'm going to ask you to go with me to John real quick. The Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 17. John, chapter 5, verse 17. That's, that's the New Testament page 152. And anytime you guys have any thoughts, questions, don't ever hesitate. Remember, this is your group as well as it's my group. So any thoughts, questions, comments, don't ever hesitate. So John in the New Testament, page 152, verse 17. Remember that, you know, they're always talking to Jesus, okay? And this is what Jesus Christ says to him. And actually, we'll read from, uh, just to have a little bit of context, we'll read from, we'll read John chapter 5, verse 1. It says, After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem at the sheep gate a pool called, in Hebrew, Bethesda, with five porticos. And these lay a large number of ill, blind, lame, and crippled. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years, when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he was, had been ill for a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. While I'm on my way, someone else gets down there before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your mat and walk. Immediately the man became well, took up his mat and walked. Now that day was a Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who was cured, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your mat. And he answered them, The man who made me well told me, Take up your mat and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who told you to take it up and walk? The man who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had slipped away, since there was a crowd there. After this, Jesus found him in the temple area and said to him, Look, you are well. Do not sin anymore, so that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went and told the Jews that Jesus was the one who had made him well. Therefore the Jews began to persecute Jesus because he did this on the Sabbath. This is where I want you guys to get. Jesus answered them, My father is at work until now, so I am at work. So even Jesus Christ himself says in this scripture that the father is still at work. Okay, And I'm not talking about just taking care of the universe, taking care of everything he created. I'm talking about overall everything. But this is just something to open up our minds saying that even Jesus Christ himself says, My Father is at work until now, so I am at work. So it's just something that I wanted just to open up to you guys regarding that. So when you go back to Genesis chapter 1, I put a note here and I said, God is almighty. By His spoken words, He called into existence all things. In other words, God did not go and mold the sun or mold the, the moon or mold the sky and create these things. 
It was by His spoken word that all these things came to be. When you read it and He says, let there be light, it was through His voice, through His spoken word that all this stuff came to be. You know, when He said, separate uh, the waters and the dome and the dirt, all this is just spoken commands of God Almighty, and that's how all things came to be. So God has to work to provide for all He has created. Only God can control, sustain, and govern what He created. Now, man has created a lot of things. So man has to take care of all those things that man has created. But when God creates something, God has to continue taking care of it at all times. Okay? Any thoughts, any questions up to now? Any comments? Well, I would say that God creates and man builds. Yes. Yes, uh, man. So I'll rephrase my words when I said man creates certain things. I'll say man made certain things. Automobiles, chairs, tables, builds, and so on. So man never creates. So thank you for that. Anybody else? Any other thoughts, questions? Well, that creates. Man can create from things that were given to us by God. Natural resources, knowledge. All the minerals that we can take from the earth that God provides, we use that to build with the And see, I don't give man no credit. See, people, people always say, well, so and so discovered electricity or, or so on and so forth. I truly believe that God allowed that individual to do something to benefit us because we are what He has created. Does that make sense? Yeah, to you guys? Does that make sense? I was going to no. say that because without everybody being like their own person, um, there's smarter people. Um, some are smarter than others, and that's the reason why God made this world because He wanted everybody to be their own person. But also, at the same token, He, he put a bunch of different people with knowledge to create everything that we have today. To, 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 to build stuff to, exactly. to benefit us, His yeah. creation, right? Yeah, like Einstein to, and all those yes, things. Yes, to comfort us, yes. to, to just like air conditioning. Yeah. You know, exactly. so God didn't want to see us uh, struggle. Yeah, struggle. So he, he gives men the intelligence to build something to benefit all of humanity, you know? Because if you think about it, if we would if we want to have those people to do that, think about it. I mean, would we have what we have today? No. Oh, no. no, just like just think, just thinking back to to any little tiny thing, and that's why that's why I chose to, to to do this teaching tonight because a lot of times we forget where we all have come from. All of us we forget we forget about creation. We forget about everything that God did and how God put it together so perfect that maybe sometimes in our lives we're doing a little bit to to destroy it. No? And then if we come back to the reality, reality, or to or the, uh, the the focus point of helping God protect what He has created, that's why God wants us to love each other. That's why that's why God wants us to respect each other. That's why that's why God wants us to care for each other, because He created all of us. So He wants us to help Him take care of us. That you know. So that, that's what's so important for all of us to see because we can go over all this, well, God wants you to do this and God wants you to do that or, you know, good morals or good values about this or about that. But if we have a good understanding about what God did from the very beginning, then we can do that on our own, you know, for our own conscience. And especially the younger people, especially, you know, when God has created humanity, you know, like He says, let's make man in our image and our likeness. God did something so beautiful there to allow us to be created in His image and His like likeness and for us to destroy that. That's why that came to, my, to me this morning when I was in the shower. I don't know why I talked to you guys about this before, but my mind always thinks, you know, like in 1 Corinthians it says, if you, uh, don't you, do you not know that your body is a temple of God? And if anyone destroys that temple, God will destroy that person. You know, when God created us, He created us perfect. 
He loves us and He wants us to take care of whatever you know, He has given to us. And if we destroy it, God says there's going to be a penalty for that, no? Yeah, just sure. like taking life for granted, like you said, the body's a temple, you shouldn't mark it. Amen. And um, you shouldn't take life for granted and be selfish. You, know? and, and, you, should, you should always reflect back on that. Yes. And always, you know, always do something good for somebody, you know, at, at, at times, you know. You know, and just be thankful for what we have. And those that, that have marked it and have done stuff, a lot of times they do it not knowing, but now as long as they get the opportunity to know, then they don't have to do it any further. You know what I mean? And that's, that's what I feel is so important for us to know. So coming back to, to I'm going to spend about five more minutes and we're going to take a break. So every day, this is what I want all of you guys to remember. If God, okay, if God with would, would withdraw his hand from governing, from taking care of the universe, do you think that we would be in, in trouble? If God did, you know, if, if the rains just came and the snow just came and the temperatures, whether they be freezing or hot, and everything just went off of his uh, hands, do you think that we would be in trouble? I think that humanity really needs to thank God a lot more than they're thanking Him because, you know, I think a lot about how devastating water can be. You know, for instance, we hear about these typhoons or even uh, wind can be, no? How devastating wind can be. Just imagine if God didn't control all that. Just imagine if it was just, we wouldn't be here, you know? So that's something that we need to be thankful for. That's something we need to be grateful for. And that's what I put in my notes. I said, if God would, would, would withdraw his hand back, everything would collapse. I said, every day, every hour, every minute, every second, every breath, is a gift from God. And if humanity would only see this, this whole world would be a different place, you guys. What do you think the wind is for? I, I, I've understood the, the rain, the snow, the fall and all that, but that's a good, that's a good point that you brought up. Well, okay, so remember, if you take your mind thought back to Genesis, we just read Genesis, it says in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless wasteland and darkness covered the abyss. Well, a mighty wind swept over the waters. So the mighty wind is always described as the Holy Spirit, okay? I've, I've always looked at wind in many different uh, ways. You know, if the wind wasn't here, you know, when you get pollen, you know, you know, it gets really windy and you get that pollen blowing everywhere. And people are saying, why does it have to be windy? This pollen's getting uh, blown everywhere and it's making everybody miserable, right? Well, I've always believed that without that pollen going everywhere, nothing would be pollinated. Nothing would bud, nothing would sprout. Second of all, if there's a lot of dead uh, branches or leaves on the trees, how does that tree get rid of it besides the wind? So, there, you know, you can go on and on about all the good things about the wind, huh? but you have to ask yourself this question. Why did God create cockroaches? To put salmonella everywhere? Well, there's a reason why he did that, huh? What the true reason is, Mankind, I believe, doesn't even know what the true reason, the ant, the stink bug, the centipede, they all have a reason for being here on this earth, no? So what's the cockroaches? I, 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 I can't answer. I'm just saying... You know, they carry salmonella, right? Well, 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 they carry a lot of stuff, but there's also got to be a good that comes out of that, uh, that, that, that bug, that creature, that beast, whatever it is, no? So, so God created everything for a reason, huh? And mankind really doesn't know. They assume 
they believe, you know, certain things are going to do certain things, but to have it 100% correct, I don't believe they have it correct. No? And, and the thing is, is that me standing up here, my intellect is just a granule because there's many people who do this studying year after year, 30, 40, 50 years. They study just on one specific thing, and they're very good at that, no? So, so that, that's something for us just to open up our eyes just on this general big picture of the creation, okay? Because what I put here is that every day, every hour, every breath, every moment is a true gift from God, and that's what we have to start being thankful for. Now I put also here that man has to rest. God gave us an example. He worked for six days, and He rested on the seventh. Us, you know, if we cannot even see that example of how God worked and then rested, we have to actually look at that. What you guys are going to be doing on, on the Lord's Day coming up, that's going to be up to you guys. But the thing is, I am going to change my day quite a bit, and I'm going to reflect more on what God has done, what God has created, what God has has put into existence because now I want to start seeing for myself and start trying to understand a little bit more what God did for all humanity instead of just the rules and the regulations, you know? A lot of times our lives are all about, well, God said you can't do this and you can't do that. God said if you do this and you do that. That's kind of where our lives have, have gotten to that place. But in reality, we need to kind of back up a little bit and see all the beauty that God has, has placed here on this earth for us, you know? You know, even on, on the fruits, fruit trees, apples, oranges, how many of you guys eat fruit on a daily basis? The best, best thing on the, on the earth, we're always looking to pills, we're always looking to something else to give us energy to take care of this disease or that disease. But don't you guys really think that when God created all these things, that really and truly the cures are probably here in those fruit trees, you know, coconut. Why did God create a coconut? Well, I don't know, but maybe if a person were to eat a coconut one day and an orange the next day and a lemon the next day and things in our lives and our bodies would probably change for the best, you know what I mean? You know, instead of always getting into, in other words, back then, when you read about Jesus, you read about Jesus eating bread, drinking wine, eating figs, uh, what else? Fish. Fish, a lot of fish. Lamb. Lamb. Bread. What happened to all that eating, you guys? How many of us eat like that? I do. <laughs> good, no, that's good, that's a blessing. But even for myself, you know, this, this is just all an eye-opener for me, you know, on what I'm going to, it's never too late, I don't care what age you're at, I don't care what your intellect level is, it's never too late to start, um, you know, participating into what the Lord has done for us, no? what the Lord has created, what the Lord placed from us. I mean, He did this at the very beginning, of, of before even man was even created, He created all these plants for you and I before we, we were even created. So it's just something for all of us to start reflecting on, no? start thinking about it. You know, a lot of people say, well, I'm not a... Uh, you know, people, you, you, you see people going to Sprouts or alfalfas or those different places and you say, oh no, those are nature lovers or, or uh, we have a bunch of comments for those people, yes or no? But yet, they kind of have it right, you know what I mean? And yet we're walking in there, we're buying uh, greasy tacos and burritos and you know, there's nothing wrong with those as long as they're, they're, they're made right, no? It's just a thought, I just, you know, just, just a thought, no? So, just remember that, you know, on the Lord's Day, dedicated to the Lord. So we need to put all the world's dues, desires, 
pleasures their way in focus on God. Be thankful to God. You know, how hard do you think it'll be for you to spend your whole day thinking about the good things in life? It's hard, no? It'll be hard. Because we're so tied up with all the, the, the things of the world. You know, we're so polluted that for us to actually spend the whole day focusing about the good things of the Lord, it'll be a, it'll be a trial, no? It'll be a, 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 a thing for us to, to try and get past, no? It might end up being an hour. Might end up being two hours, but the whole day, you know, to each their own. And we'll have to see how that works out. So I believe that, you know, when you look at the scripture that we've been going over, when the people would take the other people to be healed by the Lord, the paralytic, the, the lame, the blind, the first thing that Jesus Christ would do is he'd forgive their sins. No, we went over this. So Jesus, the focus of Jesus was to heal that person from the inside first, no? and then heal him physically. Well, this seventh day, I think it's supposed to be that we need to start thinking about our souls. No? Not about reflecting on how we're going to do things better on Monday, but how we're going to, you know, for our job or so on and so forth. But I think that the, that the Lord's day is supposed to be that we can focus on our souls, no? Uh, on what's going to happen with us when we leave this earth and where we're going to go to, you know, where we're going to spend all eternity at, huh? So that's what the note that I put here, that it's called the Lord's Day, not our day, but the Lord's Day. And we need to put all the world's dues, desires, pleasures away and focus on God and be thankful to Him. To think of our souls, not our bills. So... I put, I put one last uh, note here that I'm going to go over, and then we're going to go for a break. I said, and, and it's kind of hard to even read my own um, writing, but even non-believers enjoy that day off. Like I said earlier, atheists, you know, they follow the whole tradition of the world of taking off that one day. It's not, they don't give it to the Lord, but they'll follow that tradition to take off and do nothing, no? So, this day, we should spend being thankful to God. So, any thoughts, any questions, any comments before we go to this break? So, let's just take a five minute break and we'll come back and we'll continue on it. So, as we, as we come back from this break, I want to share a few things with you because this is going to be a short teaching tonight. But I just want each and every one of you guys to really focus on what we're going over tonight. So you have the opportunity to go back and to read and learn and be able to share this with somebody else in their life. Especially when it comes to creation, especially when it comes to God. Now... I put a note here and I put all of creation testifies to the power of God. So as human beings, how come we don't testify to the power of God? You know, many people, you know, have questions, well, what about God or how do I know that God exists or, you know, how can I understand it? You know, these, this Genesis chapter 1 is a perfect place to take somebody to, the, to or a good, even family, just to sit down and talk about this, talk about the creation, talk about how good God has been since the very beginning and how He has set it all in place for each and every one of us. You know, I'm going to share this, this, this picture with you, if you will. If you stop to reflect on the rivers and the streams, when the waters are running to the rivers and the streams, these rivers and these streams are running to the ocean, no? And they're always running. They never, ever stop, right? How many of you guys have ever thought about that? I have a lot of time. So you have this water, you have this, this rivers, these streams, and this water running all the time, continuously, continuously running, and they go to the sea, no? 
So you have these rivers and these streams and they're flowing day and night down into the sea and they're pushing millions and billions and trillions of gallons of water into the sea. How come it never fills up? Because it evaporates. Do you, know, do you know how you can make water out of salt water? Fresh water out of salt water. Well, let's, 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 let's focus on the question real quick. So, you say that the water evaporates. Who came up with this evaporation system? So, that's something that, that I want you guys to just reflect on because you have billions and billions and trillions of gallons of water running into the sea, but it never fills it. And it never, ever overflows, right? So we know that God created all things, right? God created the water rising, you know, the, the water settling, everything from the very, very beginning. So how is it that these waters and these streams are always running and they never shut off? Where does that water come from? So there's a water there, there's a water cycle, a water system, some kind of development that was created by God, but in a perfect, perfect way. No? That's something that especially if we've never gone over it before, stop and see that because the water can run and it put trillions of water. You know, the sea will never overfill, but yet the water comes up and it evaporates, comes up, goes up to the system. Is that water going up to that system that we read about on the other side of that dome? It has to come back down eventually, right? But it has to go up somewhere, no? So, both the mists, the clouds that rise from the sea, are driven over the dry land and fall back onto the earth in the form of what? So in other words, if the water, if these trillions and trillions and trillions of gallons are going into the sea, it's not overfilling and it's not uh, um, causing problems. So if it's, if it's evaporating or coming off the top of the sea, where does it go from there? What happens to it? Some of it goes back again as moisture. Some of it gets created in humidity. So, so there's a lot of things in our minds that we can respond to out of our experience as human beings. But how many of us have ever sat down and thought about it, how God put this perfect circulation system together, no? It's just like the body. You know, they say that man has taken the human body and they have created billions of things based off the human body, right? Pumping systems, how the heart pumps the blood, how it uh, travels from one vein to another vein. Uh, you know, eyesight, that's how we have cameras, that's how we have telescopes, that's how we have all this stuff, right? The hearing of the human being. Mankind has made things just based off the, the, the hearing of a human being. You know, the hands. People have made claws or, or uh, buckets or uh, things to scoop even so much as a spoon, right? Because the hand can scoop up water. So somebody uh, got something flat and, and uh, 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 scooped out of it, and now they use that for a serving spoon and so on and so forth. Now, all of this comes based off of what? Off God's creation, right? So they took what God created and they started making different things off of what God created. Same thing goes with the with the airplanes, right? How did they how did they start flying airplanes? Based based off a bird, right? 
They'd watch these birds and see how these birds took off, how they can glide, how they can go up and go down. I mean, all, all this stuff comes off of God's creations. Everything, everything that, 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 that God created, mankind has studied it, and they've actually done something and then built something with it, not off of God's creation. So God did not leave us empty-handed. God actually left us with some perfect things that we can uh, build off of, no? Same thing goes with time, with uh, night, day, you know, and so on and so forth, no? Now, <clears throat> the moisture collects, forms, springs, feeds the streams, the waters, the rivers, okay, which take the water back to the sea. So in other words, this water cycle, I cannot stand up here and tell you exactly how it works, because I don't know. But all I can tell you is that the way God designed it, the way God has it all together, that's the reason why the world is still existing today, because of God, no? Because God has created something so perfect, and He has kept it up with the maintenance that only He knows what it is, and that's why the world is still intact. That's why the universe is still intact. Man has been destroying everything that God has done since the very beginning, and they will continue destroying it. Sometimes we destroy a little bit ourselves, not knowing no, on, on the, some of the things that we do or don't do. That's why, you know, when you get into recycling and so on and so forth, it's a lot of work. But the thing is that we can help do our part, no? Now, so that was my thought that I had, that the sea never overflows and the rivers never dry up. So all of this he protects to provide for all of us. So this is where the key theme comes in. Everything that God has done, he's done and kept it up for you and I. So right now, in the year 2015, the reason why we still have everything that we have is because God has kept it up for us. No? Even though that we were only born, you know, a year ago, five years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, whatever, whatever it is, God has always promised that He would take care of all humanity. No? That's why He says... You know, man, man says this, okay, man says, stop having kids. There's not enough room on the earth, we're going to run out of water. We're going to run out of food. We're going to run out of this, we're going to run out of that, right? But what does God say in the very beginning? Be fruitful, multiply, Be fruitful and multiply, right? So we have the world telling us stop, and we have God telling us go for it, right? So the thing is, is that... We believe in God. We trust God. God has, has taken all of humanity to where we are to this present day. So we trust Him. We believe Him. We love Him. We honor Him. And we worship Him. No? Man keeps telling us, don't do this, don't do that. We're going to run out of these resources. And so on and so forth. So the thing is, is that man always has his own uh, priorities. No? But God, all God wants is for all of us to love each other, to be happy. And if we actually look back, we can actually survive off of what God has given to us. God has given to us water. He's given to us plants that provide food. And He's provided animals. No? So in reality, we don't need anything else if that's the way we choose to live. That is the perfect plan that God has given to us. Unfortunately, we've gotten spoiled in our lives and we depend so much on everything else, no? It would be really hard for us to go back and to just live off the basic necessities. But many people do it. There's a lot of people out there and they all they do is just live off the basic necessities, no? So this teaching is something to help us, to guide us, to say, hey, look, since the very beginning, God made it so simple, so beautiful, so awesome. And yet mankind has taken all that and they've distorted it 
to where it's uncontrollable now, no? But as long as we keep looking to what God created, we can keep that encouragement of, you know, this is, this is, this is one of the things that I wanted to continue sharing regarding this, that a note again, all of this, God protects. Why? Because God has to provide for all that He created from the very beginning. So it's not just us human beings. God still is taking care of all the creatures. You know, from the sea to the mountains, every creature that's out there, God still provides for them. You know, as a matter of fact, Jesus Christ says in the New Testament, He says that humanity is always worried about this and that. And Jesus Christ says, look, look at the birds in the sky. They don't work extra hours. They don't work on weekends. They don't uh, try and save all the money that they make to do this or that. And Jesus Christ says, look at the birds in the sky. They don't do any of that, but yet your Heavenly Father takes care of them, right? That's the same way we're supposed to be thinking about life. We're supposed to be thinking about life while, you know, the Lord will provide. The Lord will provide, huh? Instead, we, we overwork ourselves, we stress ourselves, we hurt our minds, our bodies, we hurt our souls, all because we're trying so hard just to get something more in this life. When the Lord says, all you have to do is just put all your faith and your trust into God, and He'll take care of everything for you, right? Isn't that what the Scriptures always tell us? Always, over and over and over and over. How can you work, add a moment to your, life, your lifespan by worrying? And yet we're so engulfed in this world. We're so engulfed into all the things, the pleasures, the desires of the flesh, that we forget about the simplicity that God put together for us from the very beginning. You know, that's what tonight's teaching is about. It's about really focusing on what God really has done, not only for us, but for all the creatures, all the animals, you know, and for the environment, for the atmosphere, for the clouds, for the sun, for the moon, all that. God told us He'll take care of it. He's the creator of it. Do you think that anything that God has created will fail? Can't fail. Can't fail because He's the creator of all things. He's God Almighty. Nothing that He has done will fail. But you get an automobile that man has built, even though they've had the technology for so many years, will that car break? All the time. Will that truck break? All the time. Will that brand new roof leak? All the time. Because that's the... the the things that man has put together. But what God has put together, it's put together perfect. No? Everything He has done is, is put together perfectly. Now, I put a couple of notes here and I said, God will protect to provide all that He has created since the very beginning. All He created can survive on the first things that He created. Just on this two chapters, chapter 1, chapter 2, all of humanity can survive on chapter 1, chapter 2, and all the animals can survive on chapter 1 and chapter 2. After that, then it starts going into all the world and so on and so forth. But all, all that God created can survive on these two chapters, and you go back and you read it. The first things that He created in the six days. All of this because He still works to provide for the plants, for the animals and the humans. The plants, He still provides the sun. He still provides the water. He still provides the air, right? The animals, He still provides the green grass, the plants to eat, the air, the water, and the light. Humanity, He still provides because He still provides with the water, with the air, with the animals, with the plants, with the trees, with the fruit. Simple. Simple, simple, simple. But yet, as human beings, we've made it chaos. But if you stop to think about it, God, in the very beginning, made it so simple for all of us to survive.
so simple that in your own backyard, you can survive by what you grow because God will still give you the water, He'll still give you the sun, He'll still give you the air. You can live in your own backyard off what comes out of the ground. In your own backyard, you guys. You don't have to let the world engulf us and say, well, we can't do this and we can't do that. Now, let me ask you guys a question. What happens when you get, say, a 50-gallon bucket of water and you fill it up and you let that water sit? What happens to that water? It turns to, it turns on milk it starts um, creating bacteria. Okay. So and it starts to um, evaporate within time. So if we get a bowl of water, or even a cup of water, and we leave it out there to the elements of the sun, you'll get growth in it, no? Mm -hmm. You'll get bugs. You'll get a lot of stuff that uh, is extremely bad, right? So. How many of you guys have ever thought about the ocean? Do you guys know how big, how big the, the ocean is? Or how big the... Um, it's like, it's like two-thirds of the size of the world, right? It's like seven, it's like, uh, yeah, two-thirds of water and a third of the world of um, dirt. So, this is what I'll read to you. The, Infinite greatness and majesty of God are also revealed to us by His creation. <clears throat> Think how enormous the earth is. It is 24,899 miles in circumference. The total area of its <coughs> surface covers 190,000 million square miles. The corresponding volume is 260 millions of cubic miles. It says that the sun is 1,400,000 times as large as the earth. Did you guys know that? That the sun is 1,400,000 times as large as the earth. So, the nearest fixed star, okay, the nearest fixed star, do you guys know how far it is from the Earth? About 50,000 miles away. The nearest fixed star. <coughs> so the sun is 93 million. So the nearest fixed star is about 20 billion miles away from us. So you see all this and you're saying, this is all amazing, no? The reason why I asked you guys about that water is when you have billions and billions and billions of water sitting in the sea, right? How come that sea is not just a big old ball of moss? How come it's not so polluted and so disgusting that people can't swim in it, fish in it, or anything? So, so what Steve said is something very important. Keep cycling, huh? Water movement, right? Well, who's moving this water? What makes this water move? God. He's got it, huh? So, so that's how. That's how. In a nutshell, if you actually just look at the sea and you see the waves, you see the cycling of the water, God even knew that that's what had to be done. If not, that water would get stagnant and be poisonous, right? To not only to the creatures, but to us. So that's how awesome God is. That's how powerful God is that, you know, there, there's terminology for all this that I'm talking about, huh? I'm just talking about it in, in my own language. But God Himself steers up this water so none of this happens. You know, how many of you guys have ever stopped and thought about that? That God is steering up this water. That God is doing this. God is doing that. All because He loves us. Because He remembered that when He created all humanity, 
that he had to keep continue taking care of us. I'm going to be honest, I've never even thought about it. You know, after, you know I've read these scriptures I mean, countless times, but it wasn't until I actually stopped and I focused about it, and I actually spent the time going through it, that my own mind and my own heart really, really leap for joy by what God did for all of us, you guys. What God has done for us, not only, first of all, giving us the human body and life, but how we put it all together was amazing. And it's still amazing to me because I still have a hard time comprehending it because of how awesome God is. But as long as you guys can see this, chapter 1 and chapter 2, and how amazing God put it all together for us, but also put it together so that His own creation would continue taking care of humanity even if we don't love Him. Even if we forget about Him. Even if we're doing bad things. God is still there taking care of us. God is still watching over us. God is still taking care of the creation that He created from the very beginning. That's how amazing God is, you guys. No matter if we're failing Him, no matter if we turn our back on Him, no matter if people are killing what He created, God is faithful and He still continues taking care of us through, through, through nature. He still says, you know, I'm going to take care of you guys. I love you guys. I created you guys and I'm going to take care of you. I created all the animals, all the plants, and I'm going to keep taking care of them. You know, that is so awesome for us to see how good and how gracious God is to each and every one of us. That no matter what we do, no matter what, what uh, nations do, no matter what countries do, God just continues taking care of people. You know, so that's what I wanted to share with you guys tonight. That's what I wanted to bring to your attention. That's what I wanted to open your minds to, is that God is always taking care of us from, from, the, from the very beginning when He did it, when He created humanity. He's still taking care of us this very day. Right now as we speak, when that rain comes down, thank God. When that snow comes down, don't complain it's cold. Thank God. When that wind's blowing and you don't know why that wind's blowing, thank God. When that bug is crawling in your cabinets and you pull out that thing of poison to kill it, I'm not going to tell you not to do it or to let it live. But whatever your decision is, thank God for that creation. You know, I'm not going to have no mouse running around in my house. I'll tell you that now. But I'm just saying, you know, but just be thankful for what God has created because we don't know. We don't know the mind or the thought of God. That's why Isaiah 55, 9 says, Our ways are not like His ways. Our thoughts are not like His thoughts. For His ways and His thoughts are far above ours as the heavens are above the, the earth. <coughs> we have no idea why God did a lot of things, but He knows that whatever He did, He did it all for a reason. huh? Maybe one day we'll be able to ask Him, why did you create this? Why did you do this? We're curious on, on why. No? So, any thoughts, any questions about tonight's topic, tonight's teaching, or any comments that anybody wants to share?